Hello again everyone, it's me Matt and thank you so much for joining me on today's video. We're talking about anti-tank weapon systems. They are the forefront of conversation when we talk about modern military capabilities. Of course, you know and should know already if you haven't uh, seen the video recently about me being unable to talk about the conflict in Ukraine. But it does, you know, raise some interesting discussions and points that people have been sort of pushing online. And especially many questions to you uh, from my community saying that I should talk about, you know, Javelin and the end lore and modern capabilities of knocking out tanks and active protection systems. There's so much noise, I would say, in the military community right now about anti-tank weapon systems because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, something that I will say is they are definitely having a strong effect on tanks of today. They are doing what they've been asked to do and very well. Lots of different reports of you know certain systems being very good certain systems not being so great even a potential capability of an old school anti-tank weapon system from canada knocking out a t90 yes you heard that right there was a report of a uh, canadian anti-tank weapon system which i'm not going to mention in this video taking out a t90 it's a twenty thousand dollar unit that's all i'm going to say but uh, these are all very misconstrued articles, reports that are difficult to pinpoint if it's accurate, if it's true. But one thing is true is that anti-tank weapon systems are so heavily focused on in today's military climate. And it's it's actually somewhat baffling when you, you know, you Google anti-tank weapon systems, you look at the huge amount of articles and, and content that is out there focused recently, so, so much recently, uh, especially with like Javelin and Enlaw. And of course it's going to, but what I find interesting is there's absolutely almost zero to no discussion of the opposite end of the spectrum. The other weapons, you know, the other anti-tank weapon systems are out there, like the Cornet. Russian anti-tank weapon systems really have totally bypassed the realm of coverage, which uh, it's fascinating to me because... It's almost as if, you know, Western military weapon systems like the AT-4, the Carl Gustav, the Javelin, the Enlor are the only ones that ever exist, you know. We've all heard of the RPG, and I find that the RPG, unfortunately, is one of those anti-tank platforms that has always been given a uh, stigma that has just totally destroyed its reputation, right? We talk about the RPG being used by uh, primitive militaries around the world. But the RPG, in, in its grand scheme of things, is a very effective yet simplistic weapon system just like the lore is which we in canada still use just like the carl gustav is right just like the at4 is they're all very effective anti-tank weapon systems but it's almost as if we've completely forgotten you know other nations you know capabilities and that's that's dangerous it's dangerous for a couple of reasons first of all we're becoming so heavily reliant upon technology that it's a little scary for a few reasons. First of all, cost. Javelin, Enlor, and even some of the more sophisticated Carl Gustav systems are bloody expensive, folks. They are a lot of money. And now, I don't know about you, but I pay taxes. And wherever you are around the world, you're probably paying them too. And uh, a lot of the weapon systems we're producing nowadays are extremely, extremely expensive. And a lot of you will say, well, that's that's the price we pay to defend our nation, to defend our countries, etc. And I would agree. You know, I'm quite happy to pay my way to support mil my military more than more than any other average citizen, to be honest. I'd rather my money go towards supporting the defense of our nation, especially in the current climate, than it would be to put a new art sculpture in the middle of downtown. Which, by the way, here in uh, Alberta, Canada, we've had some rather interesting stories in the past of people just putting ridiculous artwork that cost millions of dollars. That, anyway, I digress. My point is, is that 
The thing that we have to consider here is that as effective as these weapon systems are, they are extremely costly and therefore the supply and demand and logistics of these kind of systems is a challenge. Uh, we're already seeing that uh, the supply chain for producing Enlaw, for Javelin, is, is strained and that's because these systems aren't just, you know, cookie cutter, straight out of the box, simple to make systems. We've got microchips in there, we've got CPUs, we've got complex optics in there, we've got batteries. And one of the interesting things that I found out recently, and I know I can't really spoke, speak too much of the specifics of this, but batteries for the clues for Javelin have been near impossible to get. Um, it's fine sending tubes of Javelins, the warhead, the clue, but if you haven't got all the ancillaries, the equipment, or even the training to meet this sort of stuff, it's redundant, it's a useless system. You can pick up an RPG, you can pick up a Gal Gustav, or even an AT4, which is a lot cheaper, and you can literally read the instructions on the side of the tube to shoot. And if you can look through an optic of a scope, you're pretty much good to go. When we come with even some of the more complex systems like the Carl Gustav now, which is getting more complicated sort of systems in there for ranging, it gets more challenging. And the supply chain for expensive systems like this is, is scary because we're reliant upon protecting ourselves with a very complex system that may not be able to withstand a overload or a surplus of vehicles that they're trying to engage. And I think you know where I'm going with this. We have to be cautious about saying that, yes, these are the most effective systems in the world, but you can only produce so many at such time that it may actually prevent you from using systems that are maybe not as, you know, high tech, but do the same job with a lot more risk. And I know a lot of you are like, wait a minute, take a step back, Matt. Did you just say that acceptable losses with less high tech equipment is, is a good thing? I don't want to say yes and I don't want to say no. What I will say is, is that you have to be realistic in, in combat, right? You're not always going to have this beautiful standoff weapon that can launch a missile from a top-down attack three or four kilometers away. It's just not going to happen because, as I said, you can't feed that beast consistently. Russia has somewhat looked at the compromise of that. They have an interim RPG close range, cornet, uh, you know, all the ranged weapons. I mean, there is a lot of anti-tank weapon system Russia has under its belt. Not the most highly sophisticated in the world, but it does what it needs to do. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of each platform ready to go at any one time within a battalion. Not the army or a brigade or a division. Battalions have thousands of these systems. Now, yes, Western forces have thousands of them too, but certainly not on the level of which other militaries around the world. Even if you look at India, okay, you look at India's anti-tank weapon systems, the multitude of systems that they have, which clearly a lot of them have been purchased from other nations, not the javelin not you know the cargo stuff things like that so cost is definitely a big one right the logistical strain that we've become so reliant and heavily dependent upon is is a little dangerous in my eyes and it's concerning to me because we are so i would say cocky in some regard to say that western forces have all these high-tech sophisticated weapons but as we've seen in reports and these are direct reports like this is actually from the front lines of situations that are going on in the world right now batteries are what's stopping these systems being used simple as that i mean they're having to wire up motorcycle batteries to get these things working which is is baffling to me the second thing that's a little bit more scary with these modern systems being so relied upon and putting all of our eggs in one basket is that they're not always working uh and that can actually be quite scary because if you're relying upon systems that really are just like carrying a gaming computer on your shoulder and looking through some optics Things are going to fail. Things are going to break. Microchip sets, optics, lasers, all these things require a lot of computing power. And when we talk about the sort of the degradation of equipment on the battlefield, whether it be by jumping around all over the place that they're not stored correctly, dust ingress, um, you know, water, rain, snow, cold, heat. Technology doesn't like all those things, right? A warhead with a primer and a trigger and a fuse tends to just launch when you want it to launch and blow up when you want it to blow up. Now, there are failure rates of those two. Certainly not saying that standardized systems don't have the same kind of failure rate that could happen on technology, but because we are becoming addicted to this technological factor of anti-tank weapon systems, you are adding a variable of failure that, in my eyes, could be quite high, especially if we don't have the appropriate training to accompany the soldiers that are using this stuff. Because 
what we're finding is we're pushing out this technology so quickly, so fast, that modern day soldiers that are being given the equipment haven't actually got the experience to use this system properly. It's not as simple as just putting a dot onto the target and off you go. There is a little bit of training provided there. Whereas when you look at some of the more primitive systems like RPG, AT4, Carl Gustav, you can almost read the instructions on the side of the weapon system and off it goes. So because we've become addicted, I would say, to this technological factor, we're creating a problem that could occur, right? The logistics behind it of supporting and supplying these systems and of course the failure rate on top of that could put at risk for you know going against tanks going against systems that these were designed for it does open up the question that continually gets brought up is you know are we still needing tanks and it's a rabbit hole i really don't want to go down but again the final point that i really want to raise on this is are we really putting all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to modern hdm systems are we really becoming so self-reliant on these systems working that we're forgetting the bigger picture right some of these systems are very sophisticated and are doing a great job but are they needed are they necessary for what we're needing everything that's going on in the future maybe maybe not but we are starting to become complacent in our use of these systems we're becoming to the point where we always feel invincible vun invulnerable to tanks other atgms of other nations because we have end law we've got javelin don't worry we're protected us as infantry we can do just as much damage as an armored battle group can you though can you really come on let's be realistic here okay these constant conversations of removing tanks from the battlefield and they're obsolete is is just mind-boggling now drone technology is uh, it's a Pandora's box of options here. We've got drone, uh, you know, loitering munitions. We've got uh, drivable vehicles, uh, remote control drivable vehicles that have ATGMs on them. It's another, again, huge host of questions and answers that one day I'm sure we'll start to get. But it comes back to their main point. More technology, more reliance on technology, more protection that we think we're creating for ourselves active protection systems are going through the roof in sales research and development right now look at all the aps that's being pushed onto tanks nowadays because of atgms rightly so right it's an it's an arms race it's a general arms race it's what happens someone produces something someone's going to make it better but do we really want to keep going down this route of putting all of our eggs in one basket for atgms right javelin and enlaw have seen more publicity than any other system in the world right now and of course we know why they're doing you know, a pretty significant task of knocking out a rather large amount of armored fighting vehicles that we all thought were somewhat unstoppable in mass. But this is one situation, one conflict. We're not looking at this holistically, right? And we're becoming, I think, as a Western world, a Western military nations, so focused on these HGM platforms that we're not seeing other options available to us. I just did a video on the KF-51 Panther, right? and a fantastic tank 130 millimeter main gun it seems as though the tank is not obsolete it seems as though somewhere in the powers that be see tanks still as a capability on the platform but notice that that tank structure is around an active protection system designed to take out anti-tank guided missiles maybe we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket but from what i'm seeing we really are putting way too much investment time and resources into hgms instead of other opportunities right i feel drone technology is going to completely make redundancy of certain systems out there today primarily unfortunately in my trade artillery right artillery is is the king of battle i love artillery of course being a gunner myself the drone technology is starting to open our eyes a little bit especially again in the recent conflict of wow okay drones are doing so significant things here uh and atgm still though continually turns out to be the primary focus you know and or javelin so i would love to hear your opinion on this folks you know i do you feel that we're becoming somewhat addicted to hgm's bubble of protectiveness uh and and sort of our insurance on the battlefield that will be safe against armored battle groups and systems of of today 
Um, I'd love to hear your input on it. Thank you for joining me on today's video. Uh, please leave me a like, and if you did enjoy the video, please click the little bell by the subscribe button. I'd also encourage you to check out the description box below with all the links to my Patreon, PayPal, and other sites like Instagram and Facebook. I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting my channel financially. It really does mean a lot to me, so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Truly, I mean that in every sense of the word. It's not just a YouTube cliche. Thank you. It helps support this channel a lot. Um, and also, if you want to go check out my sponsor, a clothing brand called Attire for Effect, uh, which is an artillery-based themed clothing brand, really gr good gr group of people. Um, so you can check out their website below and go uh, have some fun exploring their website. I've actually bought some of the stuff myself. Thanks and have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.